Hi everybody, it's Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're down in our uh, Fountainhead Studios on Westwood in Port Coquitlam. We are on the unceded territory of the Coquitlam First Nation or as part of the uh, the Salos people. So we appreciate their, their opportunity for allow us to be on this space. As part of the municipal update for 2022, we have a chance to talk to some candidates and today we've got Carl Trepanier. So I know you're a first time councillor or running for council, it sounds like you've been actively involved in politics for, for many years, uh, helping folks out. Can you just give people a sense of who you are and, and kind of why you're running? Sure. Uh, so I'm a 26-year resident of Coquitlam. Um, I'm also a business owner and in 2006 I moved my business into Coquitlam so I could be closer to my family. I wanted to be the dad who was always around uh, when the kids were growing up and so I wasn't going to miss any of their activities. Uh, whether it's in school or dance or any of their sports. Um, you know, I've developed a deep love for this community through the, the, the efforts of my kids, especially in uh, their swimming and uh, other sports. I got to be very closely related to uh, a lot of the community. And I started to meet some of the people in the city. Um, so one of the first was Mayor Richard Stewart through our swim club, the Coquitlam Sharks. Richard's a very engaging fellow. Um, and so I got to know uh, a bit about him and how, how Coquitlam ran in City Council. I was fortunate enough to be named onto the Sports and Recreational uh, Recreation Advisory Committee, and I've been on that committee for nine years. So I've worked in the in a city committee, um, and in. 2014, uh, the city began to organize its 125th anniversary celebration, and uh, I was honored to be uh, asked to be on that committee. And so we spent the next three years organizing the events of the 125. Through that, I got a very, very in-depth look at how the city works. Um, so we had two city councillors on that committee, a dozen citizens, and we had you know no less than three or four. Um, city staff at any given meeting and so I could see what a, a focused group they were and you know what a well-led group like that could do because you know we did some amazing events for the city and I thought this is this is a really good place it's it's well run um, you know the people get along very well and they pull together and so you know I got more and more involved as my children got older and they needed and maybe wanted me around a little less, um, I, I could go outside and, and do more and more in the community. And so ultimately, yeah, that, that uh, brought me to a run for city council that I'm uh, engaged in now. So it sounds like, you know, you're obviously actively involved in the community. I mean, that's always, an, and, and involved in politics, I think it's always a good thing to see that. But, so, but realistically, mm. um, why do you feel you can run now? And then what do you think that you can bring to council to sort of support what, the, what you see as the vision? Yeah. So, I mean, why I'm, I'm running, like I say, I, I um, develop this, you know, this deep connection into the city. Um, I, it's infectious when you get in with the staff and you accomplish things. Um, and that is a wonderful feeling when you're pulling together. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you have this, this love for the community and a feeling that, yeah, w you know, I would love to be able to take my skills and to put them towards uh, improving things. Uh, you know, I think by and large we, we are well run. We are a well managed community. I think there's a few things where maybe we can draw a little more attention. So there's a, a couple of things that I would really like to accomplish in, in a term on council. Um, you know, one of them would be I think we're facing down the barrel of needing more family doctors. Uh, I, I think there's things we can do working with the resources of the city and with some of the re resources in the community to bring us some doctors. Um, I think as well. And, and, we, and, and so sorry to interrupt mm. there, like just more detail, like how do you yeah. how do you feel you could do that? Well, we have um, uh, right now we're able to leverage development to provide childcare spaces. Um, so as as developments go in, we say to the the developer and the builder. You know, let's make some some childcare spaces here, and they 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 build that to suit. Um, we can do that for a medical clinic. You know, we can say, okay, we want in this building. You know, great example would be the one that's going up on the Chrysler site uh, down in the town center. Um, you know, it doesn't cost them any more to spec out the ground floor of that to be a family doctor practice to have four or five family doctors in there. So they're building anyway. That relieves that overhead. It's one of the major things about a family doctor is they have all of the overhead of a regular business. 
Um, and so they, they need that. So that's a leg up there. We have a couple of medical uh, doctors, like um, family doctors in Coquitlam that are part of national um, networks of doctors. And so working with them, we could attract those doctors in. So we have the space, we have the connections to get the doctors in. So let's do that. It won't cost the city anything. It won't cost the builders anything. It won't cost the doctors, right? And it, it suits, fits a need that we have in the city. So that's you know, a micro issue, but, but I've got a lot of micro issues, you know, having lived here for this time and being in the community, I, I tend to think more on, on those lines. So, you know, that's going to help 10 to, to 15,000 people in Coquitlam find a family doctor. Um, quick story on that, my family doctor retired in December. Um, the uh, office we have, they brought in a replacement. Uh, I have two children, my wife and I. Uh, one of my children and my wife and I went down to see the replacement doctor and um, my older daughter is in Victoria at UVic. She couldn't get into town to see the doctor until three months later. He's full. Right. I think we all face the same problem. I mean, three of us have a family doctor yeah. and one doesn't. Yeah. Um, and we were there. <laughs> so yeah. well, I can appreciate you. you know, I mean, to me, I mean, uh, you know, to be fair, creatively looking at how you can attract doctors is like anything. It's like a, there's talk about having tech centers and bringing in mm -hmm. smart business. So I, I think the, the the idea of trying to think differently, I, I commend you for it. Thank you. Whether that helps us, you know, now we have recruited all the best doctors and everybody decides to come here and we still can't get a doctor. <laughs> Maybe a different problem, but it is. But, uh, it, yeah, it's scale. And yeah. again, I mean, we, t we talk about we all know we're growing and we're going yeah. to grow and we know that there'll be you know we're 150,000 people roughly now will be another 70,000 will come by 2050 yeah. so uh, we know that there's going to be more need but let's let's set that process up right let's let's get those thoughts going so yeah. so so one of your areas that you kind of highlight on your platform is growth mm -hmm. you know and of course you know a growth to me means affordability you know housing is going to be a challenge Yes. Um, Coquitlam, uh, the U, you know, UBCM was basically commended for its its pool of rental. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it really said if it was affordable or market, but you you have more rental units. Mm -hmm. So, as a person coming on council, what is your view of affordable housing, mm -hmm. and what are you going to say to the younger constituents out there who are maybe you were born in Coquitlam but are having trouble trying to stay in Coquitlam? Yeah. So you know, it's it's about opening up the opportunities there. We we will have the growth. Um, we're, we're committed to growth. We have growth as really as a national issue. Canada invites people in uh, to come to the country. So, you know, and that pushes down to provinces who then distribute and then down to cities like ours. And we've committed, I think, to some sensible growth strategies of putting up higher buildings and more density around transit and around arterials so that there's less need to move. Um, long distances and so we can also build units that are maybe smaller uh, and a bit more affordable. Now we've been discovered w you know like all of the lower mainland in BC you know we we were overrun probably from about 2014 onwards you know that's when the the price of housing really skyrocketed around our community. That pattern started in Vancouver years before and it has moved out and it's spread like wildfire to the point now where you know, million dollar homes in mission. Uh, so it's it, it's an issue here. So, you know, we have the, the twin things of growth, plus we've been discovered and we're very popular and we have a limited land base. So we need to go up in certain areas. And then I think we need to gently back away. So we have, you know, higher buildings close to arterials. Then we back around to lower rises and townhouses. And then we still keep, I think, a a good solid core of, of single family uh, for those who want. But two, again, we deal here in some, some micro issues, right? Because cities really have limited government uh, or li limited uh, purview and limited funding. Uh, you know, we don't have the provincial government's budget, budget or the federal government's budget. But a couple of small things we can do is I would love to see rent to own. Well. You know, I, I, you, you lower the barrier to entry yeah, you can lower the uh, amount of a, a down payment that people need, and they're not paying into rent, they're paying into equity. So, you know, we, we should be really exploring more rent to own in our buildings. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing we can do, you know, and, and both of these will target entry into the, the market, so younger people, people entering in the first time, is, is to put lock-off suites 
in some of these uh, buildings. I, I think those lock off means what? Sorry. Yeah. So a lock off suite is uh, let's say you've got a three bedroom uh, condo, and you take one of the bedrooms and you make a doorway accessible to the hallway. And then you have a kind of a double door accessible to the rest of that two bedroom like suite. Like a motel, a concept. Like, almost like yeah. And so someone can come in, and you know they'll have a bed, uh, and they'll have a little bit of living space and a, a small kitchenette. Mm. So if you put those on, you get a mortgage helper for someone who's in there. So you know, again, you're you're helping them with with payments, but you also get a housing around transportation. And in the case of say North Road, you've got it close to. SFU, and so you, you know students need housing in in SFU. It's it's a critical thing for them. So rather than having all of those students in houses, like you know they're renting houses, they're renting townhouses, they're renting, you can have them in those suites that are almost like dorms, in there. So they have housing for the eight months that they're there, um, and then you know the people who own own that suite. They, they have a mortgage helper. But I think though, you know, I would say that, you know, I, I appreciate the insight there, mm -hmm. but uh, literally you, you hear, I keep hearing the following supply and demand, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in a traditional sense, we're, de we're supplying the demand of the people who want to move here, as you yeah. talked about, or the people who live here. Yeah. But what the big part of the demand though, is, is in a sense, people who are investing in here are really not living here, right? Yeah. And it's also the second factor, we see to, you hit 2014, is this kind of the casino, you know, hockey bags of cash coming into mm. the casinos and basically we're becoming a, a laundry operation for people to buy Mm -hmm. you know, housing to move equity, right, from overseas. So, mm -hmm. so how, do, you know, the city has the power to, because it, it is controlling the city. So what do you see the city's responsibility, you know, you know mm -hmm. to, to handle that supply and demand misnomer, which is really, the demand is huge if you count overseas investment. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't know when you say the city has the power, the city cannot, talk to an individual buying a house and restrict them from purchasing that that property. Yeah, I think though when you've got the case, I know friends that have done this and so, you know, this is, is anecdotal, but a new building goes up mm -hmm. and there's a lineup out the door for yep. people to get this. We call it the lottery. Mm -hmm. It's a, a lottery to, to get the building, yep. but that's some people when you get the building, it's a lottery to flip it to make, you know, yep. lottery return. So that is kind of, you know, there's, it's a, I think it's a shared responsibility, but the, you know, what is the city going to do to kind of let the citizens know, the younger ones for sure, mm -hmm. that they're working to at least give them a chance to buy? Yeah. It's something we can't do on our own, and, and I'm going to be honest with you here. I, sure. I, I do not believe the city has the authority. It's not within our mandate um, but to, you, but to regulate the, that entry, but mm. it is within our power yep. to work with those who have that, and that's our provincial government. Mm. That's their, and they have taken some steps. You know, they have right. taken some small steps uh, towards it with, you know, their quote speculation tax, which we yep. can get into that at another time. But um, you know, they have that uh, sort of authority, and they're very reticent to use it. It's yep. it's it's a really tough call to block. Yeah. And to to try and and do that and like I well, say, well, I, I guess you know, I'm kidding. I'm not trying to catch you on anything. It's mm -hmm. just the kind of concept. You know, I hear this that you know, if it's a really big problem, we got to let the the, the, the it's got to be provincial or federal. Mm -hmm. But really, and then I hear people say, no, we all have to work together, right? Yeah. Which which makes sense. Yeah. And uh, you've got David Eby, who's kind of you know on one side of the equation, mm -hmm. and you've got the cities on the other. Yeah. At the end of the day, you've got young people or people yeah. of, you know, in a sense, the average income in, in Coquitlam is 75000 per household. Yes. Right? That assumes everybody's working. Mm -hmm. and that's that's not, not even including tax, right? And so 30% of your income is supposed to be for housing. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm having trouble drawing the math on my, on my sheet of paper oh, yeah. to find a place that matches that, right? Yeah. And so uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is that what creativity can we bring to the city or can council mm -hmm. bring to the city to try to solve what is the root of some of these problems? Yeah. And, and I'm not saying you have the answer today, but just no. curious on your thoughts. Well, like I, said, I mean, rent to own is, is, a, is a big one. Yeah. Um, it, it will require working at other levels. Like, we, you know, we um, can ask for um, below market rental suites. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, we do that. Again, whether we have the authority to mandate that a building has to be that, and then it has to remain that mm. uh, is is you know that's a question. Yeah. Can we really force that onto it? And given you know buildings don't go up for free. Yeah. You know they do cost to sure. do it. 
um, will you drive away you know the very thing that will help you solve this problem you know will you make it so that nobody wants to to build here um, and then you have a stagnant city you know you have a, have a city where it's just okay. We're on our own little island now. Yeah. So, but you're 100. A, but you're 138,000. Coquitlam is 138,000 people. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not going to stagnate just because of where it is, right? So I'm not I'm not mm. I'm not holding you accountable for these <laughs> challenges. I'm just saying I just I'm just wondering when we look at the platforms that there is you know that's addressed in, in the sense of what you say. It's yeah. challenging, mm -hmm. but what can we work out? And yeah. then sometimes I mean, you hear this rent to own, which mm -hmm. is which is good. But sometimes it, the, you know, the devil's in the detail. Yeah. Sometimes oh, for you know, sure. you know for it sure. sounds good. Yeah. It's like, uh, but the devil's in the detail. And I wasn't trying to hold you to your your foot to a fire because you're not on council yet. Yeah. I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, you know, once you get there, mm. uh, where we're gonna be. Um, so we'll kind of switch to um, the environment. I mean, we mm. tried, I think last election is there this resilient city floods and we got fires and stuff like that. So I'm just curious mm. yourself. You know how you see that as a city responsibility and and what can be done about yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, you know. Climate change due to greenhouse gas is it's an existential threat, yeah. not to Coquitlam. It's a, it's a threat to the planet, mm. and it has to be dealt with on a planet-wide basis. Uh, I was really pleased to see an environmental sustainability plan come out of the, uh, the, the city. Um, I was alarmed by the targets and the dates on them because I don't know. How it, I, it does not seem realistic. Mm. To too short or too long? Uh, too short and just no pathway right How, you know to say we will cut our greenhouse gas emissions in coquitlam by 45 percent by 2030 it's the end of 2020 that's seven years yeah it, we haven't we've started the basis of planning it now but we we don't have detail but that's going to take another probably a year mm. so now we're into six years I, implementing it will take six months to a year now we've got five years so we're looking at a nine percent decrease in, in greenhouse gases across and as a city we have limited to no authority uh, to regulate how how that's produced right we, we don't regulate people in their cars we don't regulate uh, how buildings are heated we, we don't regulate those things so you know we are in a, in a position as a city where what we have to do is say you know, this is the consequence. These are some of the things that we can do. Let's let's start towards that. Mm. But yeah, I have I have uh, you know a big fear going forward that we won't. Re uh, when have we ever hit a target? I mean, really, yeah. we've we've had Paris Accords, we've had Accords before that. Have we ever hit those targets in in Canada? I, I think we we have a habit of making them far, far away and 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 someone else's problems. So yeah, yeah. This one's kind of short and still our problem. So I, I like yeah. the fact the date's short. <laughs> but but you talk, I, do, I do too. Yeah, but yeah. you know, look at the scale. It's good of it. to fail, right? You say we didn't are we going to get forty five percent of the cars off the road? Okay, we we yeah. Okay, so let's say just by magic we'll get forty five percent of the cars off the road. Then we're going to to reduce the effect of of people ha heating their homes and apartments and things by forty five percent. Great, but that covers about fifty percent of the cause citywide, right? Yeah. So now we have to find yeah. another forty five percent to cut in in, in other places. Um, that's that's a boy. That's a daunting yeah. challenge. But you hear places around the world they they, they want to be a green city, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at it, uh, and where they they put up uh, charging stations, the the fleet of the of the city is now yes. electrified. Yes. They're 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 changing their power sources for the city tries to become green yeah. as a, as a as a leader. We right? have a lead by example we can do. Um, yeah. One of the things. Do you think we can, we're good at that? Uh, <laughs> we're getting there. We, we again we just. Sustainability yeah. plan. Was yeah. just, well, it we was make just the introduced. seven years. Will we make the seven years. You think? I mean, that's you put the number down. So, oh, it would be, I, or you I, didn't. I but didn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, in a sense, really, yeah. I, I'm ever the optimist. I, you know, I, I, I fervently hope we will. Um, but yeah, I mean, along those th those threads, um, a couple of things I see that that can help us. Uh, I mean, I think e-bikes are going to be very interesting. Yeah, or scooters. I mean, uh, yeah, and scooters. Right. I think they're they're going to be a very interesting uh, equalizer yeah. for. For sort of short to medium trips, because I was a cyclist for about seven years, yeah. um, and it just one too many times I almost got picked off by yeah. a car. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'd rather walk now yeah. uh, or ride the trail. So yeah, at forty clicks. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, e-bikes are good, and I see some of my neighbors have e-bikes now, and they're yeah. they're not super fit, crazy. Let's go. Yeah, out and, yeah. Uh, so I have one, and look at me. I'm a, yeah, yeah. I'm the, not Mayor, the poster boy for fitness. Yeah, so. Mayor Stewart. He goes everywhere on his e-bike. Yeah. Um, the other thing we can do is is we can start to look at at solar. Um, we can 
start to lay some of the groundwork so that we are, are implementing more in, in like solar panels yeah. and those sorts of things and then feeding them into localized storage that either we use to, f to feed the houses uh, and the buildings we've got or we can put back onto the grid. Now that's that's probably long term, right? That's probably something that's going to be 10, maybe more years away. Um, but uh, it is there. And right now, my, my feeling is everybody is looking around and they're hoping that technology comes and bails us out. That, you know, we get the magic battery, we get the whatever the, right. the next thing, right? Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be hard to run an airplane on a battery, right? Yeah. And get it, get it going. Uh, so, yeah, we, we have... We have we have a responsibility as a city to lead by example. We have a responsibility to educate and then to make it as easy as we possibly can for people to do, yeah. you know, to do that. I mean, Richard Stewart is is one of those mayors that is everywhere, mm -hmm. and he's and he's you know he's out on the streets. And um, but there are people that think there's something that something's you know the city of Coquitlam is is. Uh, doing well but could mm -hmm. be better or are there some things that the, the city doesn't fit for them I mean mm -hmm. it's in the sense of like I said I think affordability um, and and uh, so it's just more uh, I think uh, I don't know if we're doing what you know yeah. there's a lot we can do in the in a city and, and one of those areas I think we're, we're kind of cut our hands tied is Port Moody has hardly any land left that city owned yeah Coquitlam sold a good portion of their land during their major kind of uh, city yes. city hall and development of police stations and all that yeah. kind of stuff and, and parks. And thank God we have we have locked out. Yeah. You know, I mean, we talk about the growth on Burke and and well, we we're using five percent of Burke. Mm. We will never, over my dead body, use more than five, and and it's locked mm. out now. And Harbor Shines and much of our forest is locked in. Mm. It creates a problem for us, though, right? Yeah, we don't well, have, yeah. and, you have no and, land. and we're not alone, right? Because the lower mainland, you know, you, you can't live up the mountain, you can't live on the ocean, yeah. <laughs> like like on the water. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're, we're moving into the valley as much as we possibly can, but a lot of that's agricultural yeah. land, and we don't want to lose our agricultural land. So yeah, we're 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 backed into a bit of a corner here. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's move up, in in some cases. Um, yeah, or like I said, we're poor Coquitlam will sell land to make make, make the book look good. So I mean, it's, yeah. and, and you don't want to be critical of that because you know hindsight's twenty twenty. But mm -hmm. but the sense of land is our is our ability for a city to do something that has a financial bear, you know, that has some flexibility to it, right? Because yeah. you know, like, uh, what do you what do you think of this? The kind of the when you look at Coquitlam, mm -hmm. and I live in Poco, so here I am, just you know. Um, you know, you look at sort of this growth that you talked about, the, mm -hmm. the buildings going up, Coquitlam Center going up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, you look at, um, and you look, then you go up in the hill and you talk about Burke Mountain, and it's kind of a sprawl strategy. It's kind of like a house for everybody. Sort if of. you're, if you can afford a $10 million house, you can sprawl on Burke. If you, if you're, yeah. if you, if you can't have a place to live, you know, we live on the bottom floor of a 50 story tower in Coquitlam uh, Center. So it, I think one, kinda, you know, it, it, useful to look at two plots that sit side by side, yeah. uh, separated by the Coquitlam River. Um, um, Westwood Plateau and Burke Mountain. Yeah. And if you look at the housing in Burke versus what's in Westwood, Westwood is large, sprawling houses, big, you know, um, places like that. Burke is much more concentrated. Yeah, townhouse. Yeah, yeah it's more townhouse, row house, that that sort of a thing. It's yeah. it, well, it's, you go further right, it's getting big again. There's a, there's a few big single lot houses out there. There are, I mean, there and and there were a, a lot of those were. I mean, that was the promise of Burke years yeah. ago: was you could be out of the city, you could have a big plot of land. Those are, are you know, there's yeah. somewhat diminishing, um, but Burke will be built in a more concentrated fashion than Westwood, and so. You know, we kind of got that right. We, yeah. we we got that, and and that's you know again that that's part of where where we need to go with it. Uh, it's a difficult territory to build in, though. It, it's so yeah. sloped. I mean, we were just as part of the the sports and recreation advisory council, we were up there looking at the plot for the new community center and and pool, um, and uh, 
Well, that, that's a harsh piece of territory. Yeah, just come down to Poco. We got a new one. Yeah. Just don't worry about it. Yeah, uh, your <laughs> pool, by the way, in Poco. Yeah, yeah. We don't want that pool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can come down any time. Um, <laughs> but so, it's it's a two lane or three lane. It's two lane and, and a big wide lane. Yeah. It's kind of it's one of those. It, it you know it's. Uh, there was a huge size, and I, I have to compliment mm -hmm. the city of Poco for what they did with um, Centennial Pool and Aggie Park. Is yeah, you're they, a swimmer though. That's the. I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and they said. You know, they, they did quite a lot of consultation with the Poco Marlins, and it started out as a a 10-lane pool, 50 meters, and then yeah. it was an 8-lane pool, 25 meters, and now it's a 2-lane pool, 20 meters. Yeah. Um, and That's my kind of pool, short yeah. and shallow. That's what I like. But it, it um, you know, has very limited utility. Yeah. Uh, and so I understand it, they're not cheap to build. Mm. Pools are, are expensive. And so they looked at the, you know, they looked at it, and, and that was a massive complex right so it's not just a pool it's it's a it's library yeah. it's a community center it's seniors housing uh it's three sheets of ice where there were two yeah. and so yeah you, you know you you tried to eat the elephant all in one bite right yeah. and got indigestion on yeah. that project well, well so. we're just we're just hoping that you guys have yours on the hill and we're good yeah so and, we're, well we're, i want to make sure that it's built yeah. sufficient and this is one of yeah. the things again that being so tied into sports is mm. and the pool is a perfect they wanted a four-lane pool on burke mm. You know, four lane pools, they don't work. Four lane lap pools don't work yeah. for anybody, you know. And thank goodness the city is, the city listens, right? And so when I brought it up on the sports council and said, look, we can't do this, yeah. you know, we, we have to. And then they went back and sure enough, yeah, the residents in Burke are saying, no, we, we can't do this. Yeah. We need it. And now, you know, we're revisiting it, but, but I understand there's cost pressure. Oh, for sure. You know, there is cost pressure to do it because that's yeah. going to add several million dollars to, to it. And so, yeah, that's that's what we face in in those cases, um, and so there's, the, yeah, council is it's not just cutting ribbons and kissing babies and stuff, right? I mean, it's it's hard choices, yeah. and and Poco did some hard choices, but you know what they did uh, was they did a, a fantastic job at Centennial Pool, of resculpting the pool, uh, redoing the basin. They did a marvelous uh, job on those changing facilities and then putting the office space in there. I mean, it's it's a real model for how yeah. how you can do that. I think though, the, what I was going to hit on is mm. uh, you go, just because we have been down about four minutes here, but okay. just just trying to hit off some real quick fire ones is this yeah. on, on you know as a first time council mm -hmm. councilor running. I mean, the sense of funding yourself and getting in campaign financing. Yeah. How are you finding that? Uh, it's good. Uh, I have a very patient, loving family, mm. um, <laughs> and I have some very very nice friends. So, yeah. so I'm I'm on the friends and family plan. Yeah, um, I'll be buying beer for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of. I know you find that kind of. Uh, was that a barrier to entry for you? Was it was something to think about, or it, what? It, it, oh, it was for sure. I mean, you need to have it. Uh, you know, just for example, the city has this fantastic citywide mailer. Hmm. Um, but to get in that mailer is is about six or seven thousand dollars. Yeah. So it went up this year, though, didn't it? Uh, it's up a bit. Yeah, it was. I think fifty. Uh, Five fifty eight hundred twenty eighteen. 2018. Yeah. So that was the one is I, I need that. And I know, you know, signs are going to be about close to $3,000 for a hundred signs. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm going to do any advertising, it's 500 to a thousand dollars, depending on, you know, how long, how often you run yeah. even Facebook ads at 20 bucks a hit, you know, will run you 500 to $800 over the course of. So, of so how do you, how do you so. feel about that though? I mean, as running that you have yeah. to somehow collect 10 grand. Yeah. And uh, and have a run for a job yeah. that's going to pay you sixty-seven grand, and and it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's it's yeah, seventy seventy-two thousand, yeah. I think. Well, and there you um, go. We'll raise there. Uh, over four years, so yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> amortized over four years. It's 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 not a bad investment, but it it's it's an odd one. Okay, the alternative is you fund it through um, through government. So yeah. government provides all the funding to it, and um, that's a, that's a big ask. Yeah. You know, that's that's a big ask, and it, it also I don't know. It, it, there's a stake to it, you know, when when you're doing it, and there's there's an impetus and a drive, and I think there's a great feeling of accomplishment to know that you yeah. can do that. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, well, uh, thirty minutes. Thirty minutes went really quick. It did. Is yeah. there a, one minute or less? Just a <laughs> sense of why you know I'm a, I'm a person in Coquitlam. Why would I? Why would I vote? For why you? would I vote? Um, I, I think in general, I believe you know our city is well run. I, I don't see the need for major change, but I see 
an ability to take things and like I say, I think in in issues that are doorstep, you know, the families are an issue, the the recreational facilities are issues that, that affect us all daily. Um, and so I think we can leverage the growth that's coming in. I think we can manage it and we'll make it work for us here. But you know, we're gonna make it work for the new friends and neighbors we have coming in as well. And so that's really gonna have to be our, our impetus. Um, and then we need to do that in a way that respects our environment and, and our climate. Uh, and that's gonna be a tough, tough challenge. I like challenges. Uh, you know, I think hard work is, is a great thing. Um, I think we've got a great staff in the city. I think, uh, you know, we have a good council now. Uh, and I think you know, we're in a good position to go forward because we, you know, we do have vision and we do have an idea of what's ahead of us. Uh, and we have an idea of what we want to accomplish. And now it's, it's a matter of putting it in place and doing it. Well, uh, thank you for coming in. It's thank always, you. always yeah. a pleasure to meet uh, new prospective councillors and I wish thank you all you. the best in your election. Yeah. If you want to learn more about what Carl uh, platforms stand for, please check out his social media site. Again, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. Thanks for watching.